Yes, I'm ready. Uh, no, I'm not in my office, but that's all right. Hello, thanks for tuning in to me. Agony Aunt Emma, Celebrity Agony Aunt of City Live FM. I'm very glad you tuned in because we have a special guest today. Live from his London office, Al, the training manager of a legal firm. Hi, Al. Hi, Emma. And thank you for inviting me to talk to you. Thanks to you. It's such an honor having the opportunity to talk to you. I know that you have a lot of responsibilities and that you play a key role in the management of your firm. Well, yes, I do. I've always wondered what people like you look like, what kind of life they lead. It must be exciting. If you consider a 10-hour working day exciting. Hmm. Being a training manager is a very demanding job. Sure. What kind of programs do you run? Quality control, work measurement, human resources, development of supervisors. Wow. Can you tell us some more about your specific duties? I have to evaluate and recommend strategies to meet objectives. I also coordinate the development of training materials and evaluate the effectiveness of our training programs. Evaluation criteria? Yes. They have to be specific, measurable, obtainable, and timely. What about measuring your outcomes? Right. I also have to set the company's goals and measure training outcomes in order to achieve long-term success. Well, Al, thank you very much. It's been nice talking to you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Welcome back, everybody. Ready for a business training session? I hope so. In fact, we are going to talk about a very important aspect of every successful business training programs. We are going to learn about terms and verbs related to training and company management. Emma is interviewing Al, training manager of a law firm. As you have heard, Al deals with training programs. Training is the process of preparing staff for the skills needed for a particular job. The first question Emma asks is, what kind of programs do you run? A program is a series of steps to carry out or objectives to achieve. You can run, carry out, and offer a program. The programs are, do you remember? quality control, work measurement, human resources, and development of supervisors. Then Emma asks, can you tell us some more about your specific duties? A duty is something that you have to do because it's part of your job. Al answers that he evaluates and recommends strategies to meet objectives. An objective or aim is something that you plan to do or achieve. You can meet or achieve an objective. Al has also to coordinate the development of training materials and evaluate the effectiveness of training programs. You can say training materials, training programs, or training courses. Training can be intensive, high quality, individual, etc. Can you remember what evaluation criteria are? Let me help you. They have to be specific, measurable, obtainable and timely. In other words,
they have to be precise, easy to measure and obtain, and they have to happen at the right time. Finally, Al says, I have to set the company's goals and measure training outcomes in order to achieve long-term success. A goal is an aim or purpose. An outcome is a result or effect of an action. You can set, have, and establish a goal and achieve, have, and enjoy success. For example, you have set the goal of learning English and I am sure you will achieve huge success. That's all we have time for today. Keep practicing your English and I'll see you next time for another workout. Bye. Is that everything? Yes. Good. Oh, and remember to make sure that Miss Bree's boyfriend... Diggs. Yes, Mr. Diggs. Make sure you let him know that he won't be admitted to this press conference. I'll call Connor straight away. Wait a minute, Linda. Let's go through it all one last time. I, I want to be 100% sure we haven't forgotten anything important. But we've just been through it twice. I'm 200% sure we didn't forget anything. Well, I'm not. So bear with me one more time and I'll let you get on with your work. Fine. Okay. So, O'Connor and Miss Bree know about our meeting? Yes. Okay. What time are they arriving? At 9.30. We're holding the press conference as soon as we finish the meeting. Do they know about that? Yes, they do. We have to be ready to start the conference by 11.30 at the latest. Yes, I know. Is Miss Bree's mother coming this time? Would you like me to call O'Connor and ask him? No, that won't be necessary. What about our client? Will his son be present? I don't know. I didn't send him an invitation. Please, Linda, I have to know who will be there. I'll find out. <sighs> Is everything arranged for the buffet after the conference? Yes. I booked the catering company two weeks ago. I called them yesterday and confirmed everything. Okay. What time are they arriving? At around 10. What else? That's it. Are we forgetting anything? No, we've double-checked, even triple-checked everything. Ah, I almost forgot. A few journalists are interviewing Bree and Peterson after the conference. Now, we should arrange for them to have two rooms where they can hold the interviews. I did that yesterday. I'll let you get that. Hmm. Hello, Miranda Cunningham speaking. Hi, everybody. It's lucky Linda manages to sneak out before Miranda decides to check everything again. Linda is sure that everything is arranged for the meeting and the press conference next week. But Miranda wants to go through it all one last time. We're going to look at the different ways they confirm various arrangements. You probably noticed the use of will when Linda makes a quick decision to do something. I'll call O'Connor straight away. I'll find out. What other expressions could we use when we are promising to take action? I'll take care of it or I'll let him know. But when Miranda talks about the planned future events, she uses the present continuous. We're holding the press conference as soon as we finish the meeting. A few journalists are interviewing Bree and Peterson after the conference. What time are they arriving? Is Miss Bree's mother coming? What other questions can we ask to confirm everything is arranged? Yes, that's one. Is everything arranged? Miranda asks, is everything arranged for the buffet? Is everything ready? Is everything organized? Are we forgetting anything? Who will be there? She gives a few instructions as well. 
make sure you let him know that he won't be admitted to the press conference. She's talking about Mr. Diggs. He won't be admitted to the press conference. A definite future event. It's not really planned. That's just the way it is. He won't be admitted. Maybe he caused a bit of trouble the last time. So she says, make sure you let him know. Make sure you do it. That means it's important that you do it. So be sure to do it. What about when Linda talks about all the things she's done? I booked the catering company two weeks ago. I called them yesterday and confirmed everything. I did that yesterday. Very efficient. Are you as efficient as Linda? Great. So did you get all that? Or shall we go through it one more time? No. I'm sure you got it. Bye for now. So, Rose, how are you? Not well. I have a serious problem. Please, tell me. What exactly is your problem? The situation at my workplace is unbearable. Why is that? I don't know why, but everybody hates me. Come on, Rose, you are exaggerating. No, I'm not. My colleagues hate me. The secretary hates me. The accountant hates me. The cleaning lady hates me. And do you know who hates me the most? No. Mr. Gradgrind. Oh, Mr. Gradgrind, your boss. You should see what dirty looks he gives me. Sometimes I think he would like to kill me. I understand, Rose. The problem is probably not as serious as you think. You could try being more flexible. That can be useful, but not with them. You could listen to them more carefully. Maybe there is just a misunderstanding. The problem is that they don't even talk to me. You could do something nice. I don't know. Buy flowers for the secretary and the cleaning lady. A bottle of wine for your colleagues. That might be a good idea, but I'm not keen on doing such things. You could invite them to your place for dinner sometime. No way. I'd rather find another job. I'm afraid that this attitude won't help you to solve your problem. Why do you think so? Hi and welcome. Do any of you have problems with colleagues? Well, I think that's quite a common problem, right? During this workout, we are going to talk about it. Today, we are going to learn about expressing reservations and rejecting suggestions. As you have seen, Rose visits Dr. Frazier because she has a serious problem at work. The problem is, remember? Yes, that everybody hates her. Her colleagues, the secretary, the accountant, the cleaning lady, and most of all, her boss. Do you think this is true? I don't know. However, Dr. Frazier is very patient and offers some suggestions in order to help her solve her problem. Unfortunately, Rose is very uncooperative. First, Ray suggests trying to be more flexible. And Rose answers, that could be useful, but not with them. You can also say, that is good advice, but, and the problem is that, when Ray suggests to her to make a kind gesture, like buying flowers for the secretary, Rose rejects his suggestions. Can you remember what she says? I will help you. I am not keen on doing such things. Keen means very interested, desirous to do something. For example, 
they were keen to start work and he's keen on martial arts. Ray makes some other suggestions and Rose replies, no way, an expression used to tell someone that something is out of the question. And I'd rather find another job, meaning that she would prefer to find another job instead of following Ray's advice. Do you think that Rose is going to solve her problem? I doubt that very much. That's all for this session. See you next time for another workout. Bye. Well, you've told me about your immediate family. Today I'd like you to tell me about the rest of your family. Grandparents, aunts, uncles, cousins. Do you want to know about my brothers and sisters? No, you're an only child, John. Just checking your memory. <laughs> right. Well, what can you tell me about your family? Well, let's see now. My family. We have a tradition of hairdressers in my family. My grandfather, on my mother's side of the family, was a hairdresser. My uncle, Lam, my mother's brother, is a hairdresser. I'm a hairdresser. Oh, and my father's cousin, Wendy, is a hairdresser. What a lot of hairdressers. Yep. All hairdressers. Do you get on with your uncle? Yes. We get on like a house on fire. He's like the older brother I never had. And what can you tell me about your grandfather? Oh, he died a few years ago. He was very affectionate and loyal to his family. You know, he met my grandmother when they were teenagers. And they were inseparable from that day on. She was his lifelong companion. Nice that. Yes. It's hard to find a well-matched couple nowadays. And what about your stepfather? My stepfather? Your mother's husband. Oh, I don't think of him as a stepfather. I just call him Donald or Don. What can you tell me about Donald? He's a hairdresser too. Oh. Like I said, all hairdressers. <laughs> Now, if you ever need a haircut, you know who to call. <laughs> Hi there. I lost count of how many hairdressers there are in Mr. Little's family his grandfather, his uncle, his father's cousin, and his stepfather, and of course him. Well, I think this is the perfect opportunity to talk about family. This time we're going to look at all the family members outside the immediate nucleus. So let's say that the immediate family members are the parents, mother and father, and brother and sister. Now the extended family. Let's go in chronological order. We'll start with the older family members first. The grandparents, your mother and father's parents, your grandfather and grandmother. Going down one generation to your parents, brothers and sisters, your mother or father's brother, is your uncle and your mother or father's sister is your aunt. Do you have any aunts or uncles? I have two aunts on my mother's side, my mother's sisters, and an aunt and an uncle on my father's side, and I have a lot of cousins. My cousins are my aunts and uncle's children. I have five cousins. I also have three nephews and one niece. They are my brothers and sisters' children. Mr. Little doesn't have any brothers or sisters, so he doesn't have any nephews or nieces. Do you? 
I like being an uncle. My little niece Sophie loves me and I play football in the park with my nephews. Now what about the members of the family you acquire through marriage? When you get married, your husband's or wife's family becomes your family-in-law, and the members of your family become his or her in-laws. Mother-in-law, father-in-law, brother-in-law. For example, my brother is married. His wife is my sister-in-law. I'm her brother-in-law. If your parents get married again, the person they marry is your stepfather or stepmother, and their children are your stepbrothers and or stepsisters. Mr. Little's mother has a new husband. He's Mr. Little's stepfather, although he says he doesn't really think of him as his stepfather. What does he say about his uncle? He says, they get on like a house on fire. That means they have a good relationship. They get on very well. What about his grandfather? He was affectionate and loyal. He and his wife, Mr. Little's grandmother, were inseparable, lifelong companions. Ray's right. It's not easy to find such well-matched couples. Two people who are perfect together. Well, that's it for now. See you again soon. Uh, let me see. You made a reservation for our tour, Wonderful Australia, right? Yes. Is there anything I can help you with? I would like to verify all the details, if possible. Sure. That's what I'm here for. Shall we start with the departure date? I would like to leave August 8th instead of August 15th. Sure, let's have a look. Yes, we have a place available on August 9th. That's fine by me. Is that all? No, I would like to visit Kangaroo Island, but it isn't included in the tour. That's true. One possibility could be an optional excursion. There's a flight from Adelaide that takes you to Kangaroo Island. That sounds fine. It might be a good idea to rent a 4x4 vehicle with a specialist guide. You can walk amongst Australian sea lions and visit a park where kangaroos come out late in the day to eat. Wow! Sea lions? Kangaroos? Terrific! Well, now let's speak about the price. Yes. The price of this excursion is £350 per person. 350 pounds per person? That's pricey. Yes, but I think it's worth the price. Would you like to see some photos? No, thank you. Hi, I am really glad to see you today. It will be a very pleasant workout as we are going to talk about traveling to faraway places. Today we are going to learn how to start a conversation, make and accept suggestions, reach an agreement, change topic. Emily has made a reservation for a tour of Australia, but wants to discuss some aspects before departure. She says, I would like to verify all the details. You could also say, I'm here to verify all the details, or I wish to verify all the details. Then she says, shall we start with the departure date? You can also say, let's start with the departure date, or I'd like to discuss the departure date. The travel agent tries to reach an agreement. In order to do that, she says, one possibility could be, you can also say, may I suggest, or you could consider the following options. As you have seen, she offers her 
an optional excursion to Kangaroo Island, where she'll be able to walk among the sea lions and see the kangaroos. Emily is quite satisfied and accepts the travel agent's suggestions with enthusiasm. Here are the expressions that she uses. That's fine by me. That sounds fine. Terrific. You can also say, that's a good idea. Finally, the travel agent changes topic and says, well, now let's speak about, can you remember what? The price, right. You can also say, let's turn to and let's talk about. I am sorry, but I have to tell you that the session is over. Bye and see you soon for our next workout. You know, I went to San Francisco last week. What an amazing city. Really? On vacation? No, for work. A big job, actually. I had to do a photo shoot for a magazine in the bar of a five-star hotel. Wow! And they flew you all the way to San Francisco to do it. Yes. It was some hotel. The bar was on the top floor with a roof terrace, a great view of the city. How many floors were there? Ten. I hope there was an elevator. Yes. Not a normal hotel lift. It was like a space capsule with a bellboy. And the reception was in a glass bubble suspended between the ground floor and the first floor. Sounds cool. And the chambermaids were... Mm, mm, mm. Like models. All beautiful girls wearing white cat suits. Wow. I'm sure. Not as beautiful as you, of course. Of course. What is a beautiful, talented girl like you doing in a place like this? What? Would you like to come to Rome with me next week? To Rome? Yes. I'm going to the opening of a Caravaggio exhibition. Why don't you come with me? I could reserve a room for you in the same hotel as me. It's more like a bed and breakfast, guest house, really. But there is room service, a buffet breakfast, and we can eat out in the evening. I know some great restaurants. Hold it. Why should I go to Rome with you? Why not? <laughs> because I don't know you, for one. You can get to know me. And I'd like a general outsider's perspective on the exhibition. Outsider? Outside the world of art. Actually, I studied history of art at university. Thanks for the invite, but I'm busy next week. All week. Hello again and welcome back. I don't think Archie got the reaction he expected from Emily. She was a little offended by his invitation, or invite, as she calls it. But let's get started with our training session. How does he invite her? Remember? Would you like to come to Rome with me next week? Why don't you come with me? He probably thought he was charming her with all the details about the hotel and the trip, but she turns him down. Now, as I want to talk about hotel and accommodation-related terms, I'm going to use Archie's descriptions of the five-star hotel in San Francisco and the bed and breakfast in Rome to help me. I have to admit, the five-star hotel does sound interesting. Do you remember what it was like? The reception was in a glass bubble suspended between the ground floor and the first floor. What do we call the person who works at the reception? The British term is hotel receptionist. And in the US, it's hotel clerk. The person at the door of five-star hotels is traditionally called the doorman. But door person is more politically correct. In the UK, they say, the hall porter. Going back to the hotel in San Francisco, the lift or elevator was like a space capsule with a bellboy. The bellboy 
is the person who carries the guests' luggage and takes them up in the lift. Oh yes, lift is the British term, by the way, and elevator is the American term. Who else does Archie talk about? The chambermaids, apparently all very beautiful girls. A chambermaid cleans and takes care of the bedrooms in a hotel. Usually, in five-star hotels, there's also room service and laundry service. Now, the B&B in Rome, where Archie is staying, is probably not as luxurious, but there is room service and a buffet breakfast. As the name suggests, bed and breakfast, the price of the room includes breakfast. We also call this kind of accommodation a guest house. If a hotel has a restaurant, you can often stay there half board or full board. That's when you eat all your meals in the hotel restaurant. I usually like to explore and eat out when I travel, don't you? Or stay in self-catering accommodation. Self-catering means it has a kitchen area where you can cook your own meals and save a bit of money. Eating out all the time is expensive. Well, that's all we have time for, so I'll say goodbye. See you again soon.